Father, we thank you for this time as we consider your word. We ask, Lord, that we continue to grow in the knowledge of your word and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we grow from glory to glory, grace upon grace, faith unto faith, we ask, O God, that this transformation be visible in every aspect of our lives, that we would know Jesus in all his fullness, the fellowship of his sufferings, and his resurrection power. Thank you, Father, for your mercies upon us, and we rejoice in all that you have given unto us. And we covenant to always seek to bring glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Love him always with first love. Thank you, Father. Bless you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, we are on the series on overcomers, and we take one of the churches each week. Today, we are on the church of Smyrna. And uh, many times people ask, you know, how do I overcome? And uh, inside, Inside the uh, se seven churches are principles that cover how to overcome. And we covered last week with uh, what we call um, the first love is the main key that is emphasized. And in first love, we talk about um, the power of concentration and trying to find that one. Ah, here's the one. So, uh, this little chart that we feel as we go along. And uh, the first, these are seven churches and each one relate to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw how that Jesus introduced himself, the one who holds the seven spirits and uh, uh, seven stars. And uh, there's the spirit of peace. Uh, FL, okay, represents first love. First love that is uh, very vital unto us, and uh, that is, uh, uh, and then uh, this one, uh, this uh, talks about uh, putting Satan uh, under our feet, that is there. And um, of course, um, we look at the tree of life that is here, there is a gift that uh, operates the whole thing. Now, it always starts with uh, learning peace. We can say that these seven spirits of God, which is peace, love, glory, power, life, wisdom, and mercy, uh, all are seven dimensions of the Holy Spirit. And just like the Holy Spirit filled the whole universe. The seven representative angels of the seven churches, which represent the seven spirits, are like um, a manifestation in terms of uh, the Holy Spirit. They are actually uh, from the seven spirits of God, which means they are not actually created in the full sense of the, of the word created as an entity. They were not created as angels. They are not actually angels. They are manifested forms. And one of the peculiar, strange, mysterious things about the dimension of the spirit is that everything that is um, subsequently um, uh, released from a spirit being becomes a separate entity and consciousness in itself. Um, let me describe. Uh, a vision that I saw in children's paradise. In children's paradise, they learn to do a few things. And among those who are more senior in children's paradise, they learn about creating animals. See, they can create animals. And they can create uh, life forms. And so, in a sort of laboratory, like a... Uh, uh, it's not made of glass, but it's like a circular barrier. A circular barrier where they are allowed to project their thoughts, their creative thoughts. Together, the main teacher in the class show them how 
to create an animal. Now, the glass or glass-like force field was there to protect the environment and to gather the energy of their thoughts to form something through their thoughts. Because thoughts are creative power. Thoughts and words. God said, let there be light, and so it was. When God gave us the power of being in His image, we have that latent ability. That latent ability. You can see that even though mankind fell, mankind still likes to create things. Except that we cannot create life because we are fallen. Only life, spiritual life, can create spiritual life. So there's insufficient. We only got enough spiritual life for each person to live their life, to sustain their body. The Bible says that the body is dead without the spirit, which means right now, everyone is given a span of life according to the strength of your spirit. If your spirit weakens, then your life shortens. If your spirit strengthens, then your life increases. And sometimes when you walk in the commandments of God, like uh, you honor your father and mother, your life is lengthened, as is the Bible promise. And then when you love wisdom, it says on one hand is riches, on the other is long life. Uh, when you want the wisdom of God, life increases. Uh, of course, we know that now we go beyond that, in the sense that you not only can increase your lifespan, you can even uh, change your soul life into spiritual life and your biological life into spiritual life which is another level, we talk about that. But let me go back to the story of Children's Paradise. And so there was this force field that looked like a glass. And then the children were gathered together. And it's a small group of children, like uh, less than 12 kind of thing, small group. It's a, like a little uh, kindergarten class, but it's more advanced. So they gathered together, and the children were taught to project their thoughts. And so as the teacher teaches them to project their thoughts, the teacher says, visualize a sheep. And so they visualized a, a lamb. So they visualized a little lamb. And then as a lamb was created, it became like a life, a real lamb. Uh, uh, a real lamb that, that will belong to the paradise of God. Then the teacher said, look, look carefully. Uh, your thoughts are not so perfect. The formation of the legs, formation of the ears and eyes are not so perfect. And um, so then uh, the children were taught that uh, the energy of their thoughts must be harnessed properly, how they must tune to the Spirit of God. It's not so much their energy as much as they take the creative energy of God, it flows through them, and then God allows them the freedom to create what they want. And so uh, their thoughts were not so perfected yet, and so they were showed how the ship is slightly off shape. And then the whole thing was erased, it could be erased. See, animals are lower structure. They are sustained from a higher life. And then the teacher showed how to, how to manifest. The teacher concentrated. And then a pure lamb appeared. And then uh, the teacher took out the lamb from, from inside that thing. Once the teacher took it out, it became manifest as a real lamb. And then the children played with it. And then the lamb was released into children's paradise. So the the higher life form can project the energy to create another life form. Why I illustrated with that? Because I got no physical illustrations in the world today. Then the Holy Spirit wanted to define each of the seven spirits. Each of the seven spirits. The Holy Spirit projected himself into seven dimensions, which are the seven heaven. The seven spirits are also the, also the seven heaven. First heaven is peace, second heaven is love, third heaven is glory, fourth heaven is power, and etc. And um, each of the heavens were designed, uh, they are progressive one into another, but also all seven exist at the same time. It is just like, uh, may I describe it in this way that, because we are born on the earth in this fallen world, you exist in four dimensions. Four dimension. If you exist only in two dimension, you'll be flat. But you have three dimension. You have three dimensions. So because of three dimension, you have shape and form. But then there's another fourth dimension. It is time. 
So you exist in a time dimension. So the moment you're created, you already exist in four dimensions that we know. You have time, you have the physical dimension, which is X, Y, Z. Three, physical is X, Y, Z, a three-dimensional thing. So the physical itself got X, Y, Z. There's a time dimension, and then we know there's a spiritual dimension. Because we have a spirit, and that spirit exists in a spiritual dimension. Now that spirit that exists in the spiritual dimension has in itself three dimensions. Because in the spiritual world, you have shape and form. So there is also a three-dimension spirit, form and shape. For example, in the spirit, there are places, although the distance is easily traversed, and no matter how far, it can be a billion miles away or a billion kilometers away, you could go there at the speed of thought. But yet, there are places. There are, there's a place called Paradise, there's a place called uh, God's Throne. So the spirit itself has three dimensions in itself. The soul dimension is originally supposed to be a part of the spirit dimension. Until the spirit fell, then the soul began to dominate by itself. So the self-awareness and the self-consciousness is supposed to be a part of the dimension of the spirit. So if you include three dimensions of the spirit, three dimensions of the natural, and the dimension of time, which is slightly different in the spiritual world, it's more events, since there's nothing to measure time, uh, you have seven dimensions. So in a sense you say, we now exist in seven dimensions. In that same sense, the Holy Spirit, when He came to create all this present universe, created it to exist in seven dimensions. Seven dimensions. And so that we will understand Him more, He released a part of Himself into the seven spirits. And each of the seven spirits, as they come down to the lower area, each of them began to take shape and form. So they are directly linked to the Holy Spirit, yet they also function individually by themselves. That is the power of the spiritual dimension. That you can project, just like the teacher in the Sunday school could project their thoughts to create a lamb, and that lamb became a living thing. That's uh, one of the dimensions. That everything that you create contains life. And let's say that you go to heaven and uh, you want to build something in heaven, let's say. <coughs> now, when you build something in heaven, we don't use carpentry tools like hammer, chisels, or machinery. We don't need that. Everything is built using thoughts. And uh, let's say you want to build uh, something in one of the corners of paradise. And what you would do is you have to concentrate and be able to do two things. To tap into the energy of God for creation and then let the energy flow into you and then as it flow out to you, you form it in your thoughts. So it's not your energy, it's actually from God. So as it flow through your thoughts, it takes shape and form and you imagine a house and the imagined house become a reality. That's why it's very powerful in the spiritual realm. Now, if it was you who built that house, that house will permanently vibrate with your DNA. Everything that comes out through your thoughts and your words and your creation will permanently have that DNA of yours. If you wanted it to have a different part of a DNA, then, let's say, and you might get another person, which is why some of the dwelling places in, in heaven right now is made up of individuals who specialize in that. So there's a specialist in heaven, well, now I talk about so much about heaven, a specialist in heaven. What is a heavenly architect like in a different profession? The heavenly architect has the ability 
to take the energy of God, channel it to different people. Let's say a person is, uh, has, a, has a DNA on wisdom mixed with uh, judgment. And that's particular to that person's DNA. And you want to build a room that brings forth that. So the architect will be able to channel it through that person and then draw it from that person and make it into part of the wall and room. Then another section where uh, he wanted another room to have the energy of joy. So the heavenly architect will know how to draw it from another personification of joy or person. So it goes through that and then that particular place will always have the DNA of joy. But because this mansion is supposed to belong to the whoever they are building it for, uh, then this person has to also add the other individual owner's DNA inside. A different thing. So you are forming and manipulating energies. This is what the spirit world is like. And when the, when the Holy Spirit decided to manifest in seven spirits, he was permitted, he was permitted to release a being that looked like an angel. The angel of Ephesus, the angel of Smyrna, the angel of uh, Pergamos, the angel of Thyatira, the angel of Sardis, the angel of Philadelphia, the angel of Laodicea. And each of them look like angels, they're humanoid form, and they take different shape, but they're actually manifestation of the seven spirits. And they can individually function because God has the ability of omnipresent. And remember the Holy Spirit is also a manifestation of God. So the Holy Spirit can omnipresent himself into seven different angels also. And they're all linked to him. And he himself will have his own, own uh, manifestation if he want to manifest as one uh, Holy Spirit with all seven dimensions within him. And that is how the spiritual world works. And in a sense, although you don't have an actual word, there is like the spirit can come upon you. But since these are all seven spirits of God, you will actually have to have and uh, you will actually have to have an anointing. You have to have the fruit of peace and the anointing of peace on you. So there's such thing as being filled to the fullness with peace. But the peace of God abides upon you. And uh, it's inside you, within you, and upon you. To reach the fullness of the tree of life. You need all these things to maintain. Now we come to love, uh, which is a church of Smana. You will actually have, have to literally be anointed to the fullness with love. The spirit of love abides in you, is upon you, and uh, so that it fills your whole being. And each of the attributes as a master, you have to be a master of peace, and uh, in order to partake of the first overcoming, which is, as we mentioned, these are all seven manifestations of Melchizedek generation. The first one, the God of peace, will put Satan under your feet. Romans 16, verse 20. We know at the first stage, you're already anointed to destroy the enemy. And uh, uh, so we start off from there. In the book of uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans 16 verse 20, it says, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. So you notice, it's not the God of love, not the God of power, but the God of peace. This is an anointing to crush Satan under your feet. This anointing is similar to what Jesus received in Acts chapter 10 verse 38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed 
by the devil. So he went around destroying the works of the devil, which is also tied to the book of 1 John chapter 3, and um, we look at verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, way back before human beings were created. For this purpose, notice, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. See that? The moment Jesus came, he came for the destruction of Satan. Satan is the destroyer, but now you've got the destroyer of Satan. The same way that we now realize, the first thing you overcome when the spirit of peace comes upon you, and you're filled with peace, overflowing with peace, and the anointing of peace is upon you, is that you go everywhere, and you put in peace, and destroy the works of the devil. That's the first anointing, which is a Melchizedek anointing, is to destroy uh, and put destroy the devil and put the things of the enemy under the feet. Under the feet is to totally destroy them, to conquer them. That's the first thing. Before you can even live in the land of Canaan, you must conquer it first. Which is what Joshua did. Joshua's uh, uh, conquest, as you know, if you look at the, the strategy that God gave him, he went into the, he, they came across the Jordan almost in the center of Israel. So there is Israel, there is a river Jordan, and they are on the eastern side. So they crossed in the middle, and then they started moving south to conquer, then they moved north to conquer, and they began to conquer north and south from the middle section where Jericho was. And uh, so we got to solve this thing. And uh, so we want to consider this fact that uh, they had to conquer the places, and among the things, places that they conquered, Joshua literally had to get all the kings from the cave, and then uh, he put his foot on the head and uh, just uh, on the neck, okay, sorry, on the neck of uh, all the enemies, and he got every one of them to do it, and that's in the book of Joshua, let's get it out for you. Just need to show you that little verse, and um, oh, okay, spelling might be plural. Okay, there we go. And uh, Joshua chapter 10, and here are the kings that they kept in a cave. And then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring out these five kings. And so they brought all the five kings, then Joshua says, uh, and they drew near, said, come near. Joshua called all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who, who went with him, come near. Put your feet on the necks of these kings. Now these kings are already conquered. All their armies are conquered. These are prisoners. The kings are all prisoners. And they drew near and they put their feet on their neck. You know why he got them to all personally do it? Especially the captains. It is so that they understood that the enemy is under their feet. And this is a prophetic act they did. And Joshua said, do not be afraid, not be dismayed, be strong and of good courage. So the Lord will do to your enemies. Then after they have done that, all five kings were killed. He struck and killed them. We know that when Jesus rose from the dead, in the book of Hebrews, we are told that everything is now subject to his feet in verse 8. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And we always look at that, everything is under the feet of Jesus. But then we forget one thing. Jesus wants to put all things under the feet of his church. Firstly, through the Melchizedek priesthood. The Melchizedek priesthood, was, which was introduced in the book of Hebrews. He wants, to make, he wants to be the captain over all of us to bring us up to his position. So Melchizedek priesthood 
only started when Jesus rose from the dead, which means Jesus put all things under his feet. Another verse will support the fact that it is God's will to put all, besides the prophetic act by Joshua, not only Joshua who represents Jesus, the name Joshua, Jesus, is actually the same name in the Hebrew. And Joshua put his feet on the neck, a uh, symbol of putting the enemy under his feet. Then he got the captains to do it. The captains represent the body of Christ, the overcomers. And we know that that talk about every one of us will crush and put Satan under our feet. Now, the place that is very, very clear that that is obvious is from the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, it says here, Firstly, it tells us that uh, in verse 22, he says, And he put all things under his feet. Do you see the emphasis? Everything under his feet. He put all things under his feet. But that's not the end. And gave Jesus, him is Jesus, to be head over all things to the church. And the church is his body. And the church is the fullness of Jesus, which imply that everything is under the feet of the church. Can you see the implication? It's very clear when you look at all the scriptures as a line one after the other that everything is supposed to be put under the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at traditional Christianity. Traditional Christianity has understood that Jesus' resurrection power is available to the church. I'll give you just two scriptures. And there are many scriptures. But it's always understood that the resurrection power of Jesus is available to the believer. Every time a miracle is performed in the name of Jesus, it is an aspect of the resurrection power of Jesus being released. Every time a fivefold minister ministers, whether it be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, and all miracles usually are demonstrated through the fivefold ministries, and then it's imparted to every believer as they train for their own ministry. It is for the purpose of demonstrating the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, okay, could be an angle in the radio waves from there. So, okay, and uh, it is obvious, uh, we come to this uh, area here, that the resurrection power of Jesus is available for the church. Every time someone is healed, the fivefold ministries and whatever they do, it's all done through the resurrection power. How did the fivefold ministry come about? Ephesians 4 says in verse 9, 10, and 11, when he rose from the dead, he took captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Then he named the gift apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors. So, all teachers, all these fivefold music came from the resurrection power. So it's obvious that the church inherited the resurrection power from the Lord Jesus. And the fivefold ministries is building the church based upon the resurrection power. I did say I'll give you at least two verses on that. We do know that at the end of the church age in the rapture, but not necessarily just talking about the rapture, but talking about the church being caught up to Christ, it tells us here that there is a total resurrection available. And that resurrection, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Correct? So at the ending is a demonstration of the resurrection power. And you have Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 10 it says, 
If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. You know what this is saying? The day you accepted Christ, the resurrection power is in you. So from the beginning of your Christian life to the end of your Christian life, the whole story is about resurrection power in you. That's the whole story. And um, if I will give you more scriptures, you read water baptism and its symbol in the book of Romans chapter 6. It says you die in Christ, you were raised in Him. Your born again experience was based upon the resurrection power. So that Paul said, if Christ did not rise from the dead, we all believe in vain. And so I draw a little chart for you. Done. Let's get a fresh chart here. Here's the beginning of Christian life to the rapture. Here's the rapture. Here's the beginning. Beginning point. It tells us here, right at the beginning, you got uh, Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 8, that you were born again, B.A., born again. So from this day onwards, you got resurrection power flowing until your rapture. Every Christian agree. The only disagreement is how much power is in the middle from here until Jesus comes? How much power? According to traditional churches, and today is Sunday, all over the world, and all, of course the other side of the world will still be a Saturday, because uh, uh, so how the world is on Sunday, but all over the world over this Sunday, as Christians go to church, a lot of Christians go to church without realizing that they are, if they are born again Christian. Don't talk about those who go to church without being born again, don't understand what born again is. But if they are born again, they are supposed to already inherit and taste of the resurrection power. To be born again is a resurrection power. But how many of them know that that resurrection power does not remain static? That that resurrection power grows in you. And this is the chart that people, most of Christianity have. When they come, the rapture time, some of course die before the rapture and then they, they're gone. If they live under the rapture, boom. Suddenly, the rapture is a superpower that goes vroom, pshkoom, like a rocket. Then came the Pentecostal Christians. They said, now I think we got more power than that. There's a baptism in the Spirit that gives you power. So they believe there's more. And so, the Pentecostals will draw it this way. Pshkoom. But still a straight line. Can you see it's still a straight line? Except they know there's more resurrection power than the traditional Christian. Traditional Christian do not know how to cast out demons in Jesus' name. They do not know how to lay hands on the sick and heal the heal people. They dare not stand over sickness and say, I rebuke you, cancer. I rebuke you, sickness. They don't dare to do that. So already you can see these two levels. The difference is knowledge, wisdom, revelation, correct? Because once upon a time, many of us were here before you spoke in tongues, before you know you could speak in tongues, and then you discover you could speak in tongues. Power unto the Lord, glory always to His name. And you didn't know you could speak in tongues and interpret. Flow into the fullness of God's rest. They didn't know they could do that. 
I was a Baptist, born again. I believe Jesus died for my sin. I believe Jesus came to the cross, died for our sins, was born again. I did not know anything about the Holy Spirit until the charismatic revival came. And at first, we learned, we questioned, we learned. It took us some time to learn that healing belonged to us. Gifts of the Spirit are possible. It's possible to enter the dimension of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, we, we, we live in that level there. The question is... Oops, okay, let me get back my little thing. Is this number one correct? Is this number two correct? Question mark. I offer you a third view. The progression is here. I mark it in number three in red. I offer you view number three. In view number three, the resurrection power increases. As you learn to walk with God, it increases. And I will base it, I will base it on Paul's writings. Number one, in Ephesians chapter 1, when Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, this is called Ephesians. It is a letter written to the Ephesian church. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church from imprisonment in around Acts 22, Acts 23. The Ephesian church reached its fullness in Acts 19 and Acts 20. It was so, so uh, powerful that in Acts 19 verse 20 it says, And the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. So that even the handkerchief that came from Paul and touched sick people, they got healed. The handkerchief that flowed from Paul touched uh, demon possessed people, the demon ran out. There was no command. Just the handkerchief come near, the demon say, ah, and run out. Of course, they might not say, ah, they got to go run out. <laughs> but I put the ah in because it's painful for them. When the anointing comes, they get, ah, and then they run out. So I add the ah for them. And that is in Acts 19. This church grew so powerful so that it was like uh, the main trading town in uh, Asia Minor. Asia Minor would be something like the size of Southeast Asia. Like, when, like let's say, for example, Singapore is quite influential all over Southeast Asia because it's a very developed country. So it's almost in that manner. And Paul finally finished his ministry, he spent about three years there. And by the time he left, a lot of Christians were there. It was a church that knew the power of God, knew three years of Paul's solid teaching, two of those years in Tyrannus school, and Paul teach every day. It's a church with solid rock on the Word, on the Spirit. And remember, it started with 12 people, and they were baptized in the Spirit, because the 12 people didn't know about baptism in the Spirit. They only knew John's baptism. So Paul re-baptized them in the name of Jesus, and prayed for them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they prophesied. From 12 people, became a big church. Now Paul wrote to them, in spite of all their knowledge, Paul wrote to them and says, in verse 17, 18, he says he prayed for them. When I heard in verse 15 of your faith and your love for the saints, verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now what is he praying? Look carefully. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, 
What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead? Resurrection power. Here's a church that was very mature. They already born again, baptized in the Spirit, seen the gifts of God, seen apostolic ministry, have fivefold growth in their midst. And Paul said, I pray that you will know the resurrection power. Huh? You mean I don't know yet? Ah, because there's more to know. More of the resurrection power to understand and to know. Then Paul himself, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, Paul himself in the book of Philippians tells us not that I have already attained and this is like you know uh, at the beginning of his ministry when he was in prison because he says you know he'd rather go to be with Jesus but he know he's going to stay back because he's, he's still needed on earth so he says not that I already attained or am already perfected but you know what Paul says I press on. Press on to what? To do more of God's things? No. That is included, but that's not the only thing. He press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Behold, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, Forgetting those who those things which are behind and reaching forward, reaching forward for the things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the outward call of God of Christ Jesus. Wow. He's pressing forward to some sort of high calling. And when you analyze the background in which he mentioned this high calling, that is, what is his goal? In chapter 3, he says, What things were gained to me, I count it loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I count all things loss. They're not equal, not even worth comparing to the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now he's telling, what does he want? He wants to gain. He wants to hold on, gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, verse 10, that I may know him and that I may know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Hey, look, Paul says he wants to know more of the resurrection power. Even he himself who had tasted so much of the power of God, he knew there was more. And so, number three is the correct chart. Is the correct chart. How much can we receive of the resurrection power while on earth? See, on chart number three, we know that this is the correct chart when you grow to the knowledge of Jesus. Surely you don't expect that your knowledge of Jesus and the Bible remain like that. And then before Jesus comes, then zoom. What? You know, when Jesus comes in his second coming, the rapture, it'll be so fast like the before you can blink your eye. You mean before you can blink the eye, suddenly your knowledge increases. Well, I didn't know you could study so fast between blinking eyes. No, it's of course. You got to grow in the knowledge of Jesus in this way, not like that. Of course, knowing and growing in the knowledge of Jesus in this way 
It's an increasing power. The question is, the question mark is not here. The question mark is here. How much of the resurrection power? And we have learned all of it if possible. So that, you know what it says here in Romans chapter 8, verse 10 and 11? The day you were born again, the Holy Spirit's resurrection power came into your physical body. And no scholar can dispute this because it's so clear in Romans chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, it is referring to your physical body and not to your spirit. See, you might say verse 10 is just your spirit. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But you cannot run from verse 11. Which says very clearly, if the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life. And the word life is the word Zoe life, which is spiritual life. The body has Biolo biological life will give spiritual zoe life to your mortal body look to your physical body to the spirit who dwells in you do you know that the day jesus came into your spirit in your heart the holy spirit power come upon your mortal body something came so the question is how much of that how much of that resurrection power in your body will manifest? That is the question mark up here. And from our teaching on the overcomers, the first thing you overcome when you are born again into the Melchizedek generation is Satan under your feet. It is prophesied in the Bible that the second thing will be your body change. In the book of Psalms 110, this is a prophecy that is for our end time about the priesthood of Melchizedek. In Psalms 110, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, now just to show you, this is about the priesthood of Melchizedek in verse 4 and 5. And it is a verse that is quoted in the book of Hebrews. It says, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now the priesthood was based on Jesus being at the right hand of God. That's the whole priesthood. Now you know why God chose to manifest everything about His right hand in the last move. Because the last move is supposed to personify the fullness of God's right hand imparted to everyone in the rapture generation. And remember, we all see at the right hand of God based on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. If you be raised with Christ, you're seated in the heavenly places. You die with Him, you raise with Him, you're seated together. Ephesians. And now it says here, what does it mean? The Melchizedek priesthood. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make all your enemies at your footstool. Now that takes place in the first overcomer. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. The Lord sent the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Then verse 3. The translation is wrong here. It should be, your people shall be willing, not volunteers. The word volunteers is from the Hebrew word, uh, to be willing to flow and do what God wants to do. Willing to be a part of doing God's will. So, your people shall be willing, from the old translation, in the day of your power, 
in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The second thing that will take place is restoration of your youth. That's the second place. The first thing is enemies under your feet. Second thing is restoration of youth. The resurrection power of God doesn't just defeat the enemy. If the resurrection power of God defeat the enemy, then the enemy kaput died, <laughs> died. Then you also kaput died. <laughs> Where is the victory in that? No! The resurrection power defeat the enemy and that resurrection power renew you. Then there's victory. It drive out the enemy and put it under your feet. Then the second thing the resurrection power began to do is it began to change you from the inside. I began to transform you, restore your youthfulness. And this is the truth that is released in the generation that is for the rapture, which is our generation. That is why until this end time, there is no teaching like that. And it's all in the Bible. We have not, I have not spoken one word, one doctrine, or one principle that is not in the Bible already. I've only pointed that it is in the Bible. Look, Romans 8, verse 10 and 11 is in the Bible since the time that Paul wrote it in the first century, 2,000 years ago. But people did not see that that verse could grow into the full destruction of sin nature in the physical body and remove. Didn't Jesus' title in 1 Corinthians 15 says, the second man, the last Adam, will be a life-giving spirit. The first Adam is made of dust. Second, Ad the last Adam and second man came from heaven to give life. Not only at the end times, not only in the rapture, but he is giving life right now to whoever can receive it. See, this is his title. These are the names and the title of our Lord Jesus. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. Just became alive. The last Adam, who is Christ, became, what was he becoming? A life-giving being and spirit. That's more powerful. And you receive Jesus, the last Adam. He's not the second Adam. He's the last Adam. That means there is no more after that. He became, his title is life-giving. Whoever is in him receives life. And that life is flow in your body, is flowing in your spirit, is flowing in your soul. The question is, how much life can flow? How much do you allow it to flow inside you? The question mark is here. It's not here. It is here. How much? And you and I know the answer as much as we can receive. As much as we can understand. But this is where the principle of the second overcomers come about. Inside it tells you how to have this transformation of youth and life giving. So let's read it from the book of Revelation chapter 2. To the second church, which is the first one was a lampstand. And God says that unless, uh, in the Ephesian church, unless you yourself become a lampstand to overcome the enemy, what does a lampstand do? A lampstand gives out light, it drives out darkness, correct? So even that picture tells you that you're supposed to overcome Satan. 
You're supposed to chase away darkness. A light is to chase darkness. Darkness don't chase light. <laughs> so when you're land stand, you chase darkness. And the Lord says, if you don't have first love, I will take away your lampstand, which means suddenly you will be darkened. Darkness will prevail. So we saw last week that one of the most important principles to overcome is to have first love for God. No one on the earth should have that first love. It belongs to God. And when we learn to give our first love to God, then only can you be a lampstand full of light in the darkness. See, it's not you and I who, who literally conquer Satan. You and I inherit the conquest of Satan based on Jesus' resurrection power. And Satan comes under your feet because light is more powerful than darkness. So your lampstand will be established. And that is the first truth to overcome. And I also call it the power of concentration. The ability to understand that God is the one who deserves your first love. Once you go first love for God, the thing about it is, you develop love for everything else. Remember what the second command is, love your neighbor as yourself. Which means that if you don't love God first, your ability to love your neighbor as yourself is impossible. And you read Ephesians chapter 5, what did it tell in a, in a husband and wife relationship? The husband loved the wife as himself, correct? Now, why a lot of husbands cannot love their wife as themselves? Because they don't have first love for Jesus. As long as you don't have first love for Jesus, it's impossible to love your wife as yourself. And for wives also to love their husbands as to the Lord, because the wife don't love the Lord. So if the wife don't love the Lord with first love, the wife will not understand how to love the husband because the wife doesn't love Jesus. That's all the disharmony in every home. In every Christian home, non-Christian home, we are not applying Christian principle. Because husband don't love Jesus first, so he will never understand how to love his neighbor, his immediate neighbor, his wife, as himself. Then wife don't love Jesus first. So if the wife don't love Jesus first, how will the wife love the husband as they love Christ? Because... Uh, uh, Jesus said, the instruction to the wife is, you know, yield to your husband and love your husbands as you love the Lord, as you, as you submit to the Lord. Same, same thing. It takes two to have harmony. The funny thing, it also takes two hands to clap. One hand cannot clap. It takes two hands to clap. It also takes two to fight. <laughs> takes two to fight. So whenever there is disharmony in a home, don't always put blame on one side. Both sides must understand their responsibility. And you cannot have harmony until two persons are willing. Always important. So we saw that principle that is there. Then we move on to the second principle we're learning about how to renew youth hidden inside the message to the church of Smyrna, which is the spirit of love. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Remember I said, everything that Jesus called himself at the introduction it's important to the rest of the message. Jesus here is calling himself as one who conquered death and is now the giver of life. Correct? He came to life. One who was dead and now alive. That means he is a life giver now. Oh, that sounds very nice. <laughs> you think a lot of churches around blowing that, blowing this chauffeur. Okay, well done young man. Okay, so he say in verse 8, This thing says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Now his title here, he also says, He is the first and he is the last. There's nothing else after him. Completes the whole picture. 
And he says, I know your works, tribulation, poverty. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Well, this is horrible. Pergamos is even worse. But here he says, a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days, and be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Isn't it strange? To the people and to the church where he wants to show them the power of life, they must face the power of death. If you want to grow in your ability to love, you must face a lot of hatred. If you want to grow in your faith to overcome mountains, you're placed in a place full of mountains. <laughs> So here is the message that Jesus says, I'm the one, the first and the last, the one who was dead and now is alive and can give life. It's a church that faces destruction of death. And they are going to go through all the Lord is testing. They must be faithful right to death. And Jesus promised them, the crown of life. And he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. The word hurt is actually a word that imply being even touched and uh, in its original form or uh, like any any tiny little affliction that comes from the second death say so why is this important and he said where is the physical Overcoming physical death. This is overcoming the second death, spiritual death. Understand the principle. Physical death came because of spiritual death. Physical death came because of spiritual death. And uh, when you look at the book of Revelations, uh, let me look and see if I did download into here. Where's my study book? Logos KJV. There you go. My translation, Genesis, uh, Logos translation, uh, which way does it go? Okay, come on. Mm, oh, this way, okay. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, it says that, that God was talking to them. Uh, oh. Chapter 2, okay, let's start chapter 2, uh, bon, oh, bon. okay. Shall not eat of it, uh, okay, okay, I want to read the one from chapter 2 first. Okay, God planted the garden, yeah, here it is. And there it is, chapter 2. We go to chapter 3 after that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. And Yahweh Elohim, which is actually what the Hebrew says. Uh, remember the old translation says, Lord God? Say, somebody, what is Lord God? What's Lord God? Why God, Lord, Lord God? <laughs> right. Actually, one of the words is Yahweh. What is the word is Adonai. Uh, Elohim, closer. You know. And so it's Elohim. So I, what, in our translation, we preserve the name of God. So it says, And Yahweh Elohim took the man, in verse 15, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to guard it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, 
But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, in dying you shall die. There are two Hebrew words for dying in the original translation. One is a continuous tense participle, dying. The other is a future tense, which was not brought out in the English. So we bring up, when did he actually die? It says, in the day that you eat it. So the eventual day that you eat it, you die. But the Bible tells us, Adam lived 930 years physically. Then he died physically. So he didn't die on the day that he ate the fruit physically. He lived for 930 years and he died. What did he die of on the day he ate the fruit? The second death. Spiritual death. And it's because the second death was on him. His body started changing. A body that was made to live immortally started dying. And then through time, it became the 120 and the 70 years today. And there is another teaching. In our teaching in the book of Genesis, we show forth that people used to live 800, 900 over years until the flood. After the flood, the protective atmosphere of the earth was removed. Life was cut in half. And after the flood, you look at the lifespan. People only live four, five hundred years. Most of them 400 years, but suddenly half. Before the 800, 900, the longest living man in Methuselah, 969 years, almost 1,000. You know, he just missed 1,000 <laughs> by uh, 30, 34 years, uh, 31 years. Uh. <laughs> okay, 31 years, oh, just a little bit more. So it looks like this, 1,000 was the basis. Suddenly, after the flood, everything was based on 500. No one himself by that time was 600 odd years, of course, but he came from the other world before the flood. After the flood, everyone only lived 400 plus years. And then something else happened. In the days of Pelag, the earth was divided. You have continental drift. Now what you see is continental drift. Huh? It's not the one time. The earth has been shifting on. The, the continent, continental plates have moved push against one another, split apart, push again, split apart, push again several times. So what you see today is not just the first movement. In the days of Pelag, when the earth split up, the earth used to be one land mass, the earth split up. You notice, after the days of Pelag, it was another half. So from 1,000, roughly, become 500. Then from 500, it became everyone only live less than 250 years. All became 200 something died, 200 something died, 200 something died. And then by the time of all the poisonous things that are happening on the earth, we seen prevailing. By the time of uh, Abraham, all hundred something. By the time it reached David, 70 years was considered a long life. And today with advancement in genetics and hygiene and, and all the proper nutrition, people are pushing it back close to 100, 120. So we say today it's about 70 to 120. But originally, all this death was not supposed to happen. And the death came in because in the day that Adam ate. In dying, he died. The day that he ate, he died. The second death touched him. The second death touched him. 930 years later, he died. Now, 
Um, let's look at chapter 3 when they fell. There you go. The serpent uh, is a liar. So when you read in my version, Logos King James, it sounds very interesting, the story. Now the serpent became more subtle than any creature. You see the word became? Well, he was not there. Originally, just said he was. No, 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 he became. You know why he became very clever? He ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see, well, how dare he eat? Didn't the Bible say that the trees and the fruit and the herbs are for Adam and all the animals? Hmm. I said that the serpent was already on Satan's ground and fallen. That is why suddenly God says, don't, don't eat. Which is why chapter 1, God says you may have every tree. Suddenly chapter 2, He says, not that one, because that one now polluted. Polluted. So God put a circle around it. Enemy already infiltrated. And then he said to the woman, Yay, as Elohim said. Now, I thought of putting a yes there, but a yes not so powerful. Yes. <laughs> no, it's more like an expression. Yay. As Elohim said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat all the fruit of the trees in the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, In dying you shall not die. Hey, the serpent bluffing. Say, no, no, no you, you won't die. No. Elohim knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You shall be Elohim, knowing good and evil. So he, he's sort of saying that, you know, there will be something happen, but you shall not die. You, you shall not die. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Spreading to the eyes, tree to be desired to make one wise. She took all the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves aprons. Then that was where the punishment started coming, and uh, all the things came. By that time, they had been touched by the second death. Now, let's uh, come out of this. And, um, okay, let's get to the Bible part. Here we are. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt, touched, affected, offended, wrong, done to them by the second death. You know what it means? God removes the original flaw that came to. The cause of the tree, eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it's just like, you know, I illustrate. Let's say, uh, uh, let's say, illustrate, now let's say he be Adam. Where's Eve? Oh, Eve is there, okay. <laughs> Eve, look up. Okay, if he's Adam, she's Eve. Okay, so Adam without glasses lah, at that time. So. Let's say that because of eating the, I borrow this, if this represent, if this represent, uh, <laughs> that one too cute. Uh. So if this represent um, second death, so second death came. And you don't mind? Yeah. Your hair got thing, right? Yeah. Oh. Okay, my nonya, nonya. Okay. Second death is always now upon him. And because of second death, the lifespan reduced. After generation, from 1,000 reduced to half in Noah's flood. In days of Pelag reduced another half. By uh, Abraham, Isaac time, 100 something. By David's time, 70. So now average from 70, 120. And there has always been that generation after generation after generation. Finally, it comes to the generation that 
is <laughs> generation that is uh, now that invisible thing is on every human being who is born on every cute looking baby no, I thought this was a cute thing okay on any cute little baby that was born that second death has been hanging the Bible says Whoever overcome, I will take that second death away. So God comes. And when He says He who overcomes shall not be touched, shall not be hurt, shall not be affected by the second death. Actually, I gently put it there. Actually, the word means is anything that is um, can be destroyed. No, everything is okay. 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 So, actually what was happening was that second death was <laughs> always beating every man that come. Second death was beating, cutting their life stand short, you know. <laughs> so, second death was happening. And then everyone who is born again, you know, <laughs> second death. Well, this is the one time the pastor can beat the sheep. <laughs> the sheep. So second death was beating everyone. Second death was really beating everyone. Everyone was beating, you know. But the second death, and then uh, in the end, the Lord says, "This shall not. This second death will not hurt you anymore." The Lord says, "Away with it," and it's crushed. Yeah. That's what happened. Now. Here's the thing, thank you very much. <laughs> Here's the thing. When did it say that this happened only at the rapture? Who says it only happened in the rapture? This had to happen on earth. It cannot happen in heaven because in heaven of course there's no more. Jesus overcame everything. Do you know that Jesus has overcome Second death, when he rose from the dead, no more to die. He's the first, first person born outside of second death. You know what the word firstborn means? Everyone was under second death. Every creature, every living thing in this warfare zone of the universe, from the fallen angel to every planet, the one third that fell, spirit beings, plants, star systems, suns, all those under second death. And when Jesus came, he has to come temporarily under it. Cannot be touched like a bubble around him. But when he died on the cross, second death pierced him. And he took it all in. For three days, there was complete silence. Except whatever, there's a battle going down inside hell. Then when Jesus rose on the dead, he grabbed keys. Yeah, I got keys here. He grabbed keys. He grabbed the keys. Symbolic, of course. He grabbed the keys of hell and death. Who was holding those keys? The devil. The devil. So it was like he defeated the devil, destroyed the devil, stripped him, and took the keys away. The devil don't want people to know he lost the keys. He's roaming up and down the earth, trying to convince people he still got the power of hell and death. He says, sorry, the owner now, Jesus. The whole of hell is owned by Jesus now. He temporarily left you there because it's not time to arrest everyone yet. Because the devil is out on bail. You know when a person is charged, they before the final judgment, they sometimes out on bail. Because if the devil had arrested all the demons and all that, it would begin the millennium. He didn't want to begin the millennium that. There is a time when he actually arrests everything. 
and the devil was placed and arrested and there are no more demons, no more fallen angel left and they begin the millennium why doesn't God begin the millennium? because God wants to pass you the key you think Jesus took the key and then none of us have the key <laughs> when he took the key he passed it to us and now he calls it I gave you the keys of the kingdom do you notice the word plural? how many kingdom is there? one why got many keys? <laughs> one kingdom plural got many keys because it's the same key that unlock kingdom over what? a kingdom from Basilia in the Greek means to rule over rule over what? take back this planet take back this planet take back all the things that Satan has stolen that becomes your kingdom and the keys are in Jesus' hand and Jesus handed it to the church And then the church lost the key. <laughs> the church doesn't know he has the keys. Misplaced the keys. The keys are all spiritual keys. The keys are released based on revelation. At which point did Peter start operating the key? The day he says, when Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? He said, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Then he says, Peter, it's not your own knowledge. This knowledge came from the Father. And today you are blessed. I gave you the keys of the kingdom. And upon this rock, I will be my church. This rock of revelation. So every time a wisdom and revelation is released about who we are, who Jesus is, what we are, we progress. We progress. The key is based on revelation. Revelation of the truth of what God has come to be. This does not happen in heaven because in heaven, right now, Jesus had cleansed it. There is no second death. This takes place on earth. How many of us can be overcomers? As many as possible. Will some people live and die without overcoming? Unfortunately, yes. But you don't want to be among those. You want to be among the overcomers. And the second blessing of the overcomers in the church here is eternal life. Immortality. Cancellation of all sin nature in your physical body. Cancellation of all sin nature in your soul. Your spirit already born again, already cancelled. Once they are cancelled, what will take place? The original life starts flowing. Foom, 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 foom. And Paul saw that. Paul knew that that was possible. But inside this little thing, you say, Corinthians, uh, uh, Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 2 to the Ephesian church, very obvious. The key was first love. He said, when I look at this context, where is the key? Where, where was the key to tap upon this resurrection life? Where is the key? The key is that you must die in order to live. That's a key hidden inside. You must die in order to live. I'll give you an example. The principle runs right through. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, Paul knew it. Paul said this here. Verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, 
but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Hallelujah. In other words, it says in verse 11, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may manifest in our mortal flesh. Look again. Resurrection power in his body. So that death working in us, is working in us, but life in you. What is Paul talking about? Now he's not talking about ordinary dying. <coughs> he's talking about the sufferings of Jesus. The two go together. They are the, they are the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. We already read Philippians chapter 3. Let's reread re, re it. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says of this, <coughs> and he says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection <coughs> and the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death, that I may have resurrection. <coughs> it's the same coin. On one side is the cross. The other side is the resurrection. <coughs> you cannot have one without the other. If you want a quarter of it, a quarter suffering, you got a quarter resurrection power. You want the full fellowship of his sufferings, then you got the full resurrection power. So some of us say, oh, okay, okay, I'm willing, I'm to give my life to Jesus, and then everybody, you know, we give all the call, you know, and say, all oh, to Jesus I surrender. But here's the thing. <coughs> A 10-year-old boy comes to the front and says, all to Jesus I surrender. It doesn't have much. Got a few dollars in his pocket. At home in his piggy bank, he has made twenty dollars of coins. All to Jesus I surrender. He got no career. Nothing in his life started. So he surrendered. Not bad that he surrendered so young. Thirty-one year old. Just about to go to university. Come to the front. All to Jesus I surrender. Oh yeah, they have certain things, maybe have some qualification by then, got more things to surrender. A 50-year-old businessman who owns a, a huge company, has a, a, a trades of a billion dollars, he come to Jesus, all to Jesus I surrender. So you look at all three, the 10-year-old, 21-year-old, and the 50-year-old. And you say, hey, I think it is hard to a certain extent for young people to surrender. I mean, each of their challenges. But the 50-year-old also got a lot to give up. Because there are some people like the 50-year-old, like the young rich man in Mark chapter 10, who was so rich and so successful that Jesus said, sell all, give to the poor, come and follow me. The young man cannot. Too much to surrender. And why I illustrate with 10-year-old, 21-year-old, 50-year-old? Because Thank you <laughs> Because What you surrendered Whatever level of your life You have to keep learning to surrender as God gives it to you When Abraham surrendered to God Finally he surrendered to God In Genesis chapter 12 and we know he, at first he didn't surrender because he put his father first. He, God said, leave everything behind. He couldn't. Finally, chapter 12, he surrendered. And yet not fully because the Lord was still with him. But he did surrender. 
it was very hard, very costly. He surrendered and followed the vision of God. But let me tell you, after God blessed him, God used him, God anointed him, he was rich, he was blessed, his prayers, his only one wish in life was not riches, he got enough riches. His one wish in life was to have a child of his own. Finally, that wish was granted. And then he ended up with two. He got Ishmael you know, from, from his own flesh, and then he got the Isaac. And so his family was growing. But the most painful surrender that Abraham went through was not Genesis 12. Or Genesis 15, when God, God made a covenant with him. It was Genesis 22 when God says, when his son was about in his 30s, and God said, Abraham, I want you to give me Isaac. But Lord, you give him to me. Yes, but I want him back. That was the hardest. And yet, he surrendered. So here's the thing. You might think that right now after listening to the message, you say, I surrender 100%. But then God will bless you, and then five years later, you want to see, will you still surrender? Another five years later, you know, when you have billions of dollars, and you're used by God, and you're preaching to one million people at each time, you have radio, TV ministries, God says, am I still first in your life? Are you still willing to suffer for me? Because and, and each time you say yes, yes, and yes, more resurrection power comes upon you. Because Paul knew that. Paul knew that this line was many, 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 many tests. And you'll be tested on what you say that you're willing to do. Because you must be willing to die and give up all at any time. And I know it's not easy to give up something, but you learn to give it up easily. I remember when, you know, when we planted a church in uh, Canberra and it grew to about 120 people, sometimes it got 150 people there. And uh, then when I was going to follow the call of God to come to Asia, uh, I said, okay, I just pass the whole church lock, stock, barrel. And then it gets harder, especially if the church gets bigger and bigger, your ministry gets bigger and bigger, and God says, okay, I want you to change direction and go to this direction. God will test him, test you. And then each time you say yes, then only more resurrection power comes. So what type of fellowship or sufferings are we talking about? Which, if you look at it, Paul mentions it this way, when he talked about the outward call. One thing, forgetting those things which are behind. In other words, Paul was willing, whatever success he had, he leaped it behind went to the next place. That's how he became an apostle. He was willing, when he planted a church, when he's finished his work, he said, okay. Then he go to the next place, the Apostle Paul actually start from scratch again. Do you realize that? He start from scratch, and then he rebuild another church, and then when he finished, he left, he go to another place. His apostolic ministry was remarkable. It's not the same as we do today. Today, because today we have to fulfill a different calling. We have to fulfill the calling of the prophecy or the big rock that came and knocked the statue of Nebuchadnezzar on the ten toes. In the days of the ten toes, God set up a kingdom. Today, we are setting up a kingdom of God. <coughs> Calling is different. And today, we are preparing a people for the rapture. Also different. And today, we live in the rapture generation. <coughs> Calling different. But at this but the same principle must go on in our heart. We must be willing to suffer for Jesus. Another way you can put the suffering, Paul says here, <coughs> about his high calling, <coughs> <coughs> and 
and it says in verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. <coughs> I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. <coughs> Notice who can lay hold first. Paul can only hold on to the things that Christ holds for him. <coughs> there will be more things in your life, but every time and any time in your life, you must keep surrendering to God. Because when you surrender, who takes it? Jesus. So when you have something new that God gave to you, God gave you something new, and it's given to your hands, you surrender to Jesus. So Jesus holds it for you. Let's say that Jesus, Jesus holds it for you. Then God gives you some more things, and you receive it. Then you learn to surrender. You pass it on to Jesus. Jesus is always number one. You know what's happening? Every time Jesus lays hold of it, then can only you lay hold on that. Jesus is holding, and you're holding. Can you see two persons holding? You're not one person holding. Jesus is holding, you're holding. So who actually holds first? Jesus. So you only hold to that which Jesus holds for you. Whatever Jesus doesn't hold, you're not interested. That's how the resurrection power flow. Because the resurrection power remains the resurrection power of Jesus. Only when it's surrendered to Jesus, then only resurrection power flow. It has to be part of Jesus' kingdom. Don't be your own kingdom. It's Jesus' kingdom. So you surrender to Jesus, let Jesus do whatever He wants with it. Let me tell you, if today Jesus comes, and Jesus gives instruction to how many churches on earth? Let's say they are, you know, let's say 1.5 billion, minus, 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 let's say they are uh, uh, minus different sizes. Let's say there are 900 million churches worldwide. And Jesus called all of them and said, I would like all of you to surrender to me so that I can do my Father's will right now to you. You'll be surprised. Some churches won't even surrender to Jesus. He said, prove that you're Jesus. Are you sure you're Jesus? You know, are you just Jesus of Bible? No, nah, you cannot be. Because why? We don't believe in visions anymore. <laughs> there are some churches don't believe in vision. Some churches don't even believe Jesus rose from the dead. Some churches don't even believe in the Bible. And Jesus says in the Laodicean church, He's knocking on the church. Whoever opens the door, I will come in. Do you know whose door He's knocking at? He's knocking at the door of the church. He's outside the church. And how do we prove whether a church is functioning in God? Here's the thing. If the Holy Spirit don't show up, and the church still can continue, <laughs> then it's obvious that whatever is done is not done by the Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, automatically we all gone. We, we cannot do anything. But if the Holy Spirit don't show up in the church today, and the church they can continue, then you say, hey, how, how, how do they? Because they're not doing it based on the Spirit or depending on the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, we should all collapse on our knees and say, Lord, we want your Spirit. We cannot live without your Spirit. We are so dependent on your Spirit. Or we are so dependent on Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 15 verse 5, Without me you can do nothing. But a lot of people without Jesus can do a thousand and one thing. So Jesus said, Well, continue, I'll wait for you. <laughs> no, no, he didn't actually say continue, he doesn't continue the sin. But, but Jesus just waiting. Because a lot of things are done without Jesus, so without Jesus they can continue. But if really depending on Jesus, then without Jesus, gone. Like that's what Paul said. If Jesus didn't rise on the day, we're all gone. We're dependent on Jesus. And you can know one thing. In this move, we are 100% depending on Jesus. If our Lord Jesus doesn't show up, we all collapse. 
which is good because we are 100% dependent on Him. But in a lot of places, if, if Jesus doesn't show up, they still continue. Now, we learn to be dependent on Jesus. We flow and do what Jesus tells us to do. We are 100%, 1,000%. 1, because we have surrendered all things to let Jesus lay hold. So my question today, has Jesus laid hold of you? Has Jesus come to you and said, I want this in your life. I want this part of your life. Have you surrendered every room in your life? Has Jesus laid hold on it? And Jesus' hand is on that part. If at any time Jesus says, I'm going to take this away, say, yes, Lord. So whatever Paul says, he is, let Jesus have everything. He held on to nothing in his life, nothing in his ministry. Everything is surrendered to Jesus. And wherever Jesus sends him, he's willing to go. Some places that God sent him are dangerous places. But he's willing to go for Jesus. Willing to suffer for Jesus. Willing to take persecution for Jesus. Because he's not ashamed of our Lord Jesus. And that's what it means. The fellowship of his sufferings, be willing to die. Unless you're willing to die for Jesus, you're not qualified to be his true disciples. Remember what Jesus says, unless you die, you cannot find your life. So everyone who follows Jesus, he doesn't want converts, he wants disciples. So that if Jesus asks you, would you be willing to die for me? Your answer is yes. And Jesus doesn't send all of us to be martyrs. There will definitely be people anointed to be martyrs. But it's just like the, the song, please don't send me to Africa. You don't want to go. You say, no, no, do anything, but please don't send me to Africa. Please don't send me to Africa. Then God will keep pushing you until you're willing to go. Then finally you're willing to go to Africa and say, Oh, finally, finally, I'm really, really, ah! It's painful. Then God said, good. Now you don't have to go. What? I just want you to be willing. <laughs> Not that He will send you there. Because there are many places He wants to send you to. God just wants you to be willing to die for Jesus. If somebody hold a gun to you and say, Do you believe Jesus is Lord? And if you do, I'm going to kill you. Shoot you right now. You should be able to say, yes. You'd rather die than to deny Jesus. Then there is this story long ago in Russia, when Russia was communist. And they have these secret meetings here and there. And the soldier burst into one of their meetings. And then the soldier pointed a gun, shoot up, shoot a gun, and says, <coughs> Whoever is not willing to die for Jesus, you better go out now. And some people left. Then after all the people left, he put down his gun and says, I only want to worship with true believers. And so it is. Our willingness is all that Jesus asked for. And God will check that willingness to know what is in your heart. That man shall not live by bread alone. You're taken through the wilderness for a reason. So that you learn man shall not live by bread alone. You're taken to persecution for a reason. So that you know that your own reputation is not important. It's the reputation of Jesus. You're taken to all difficulties and tests to be willing to be a follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we may understand more and more the calling and the high calling of our Lord Jesus. We ask that God that you will establish a people willing to live and die for Jesus. For unless we are willing to die for Jesus, we cannot truly live for Jesus. And people who truly live for Jesus are people who are willing to die for Jesus. So we thank you, Father God, 
for all that you have given to us. Jesus died for us. What other kind of love can we give to Him? He's willing to give all, to give Himself for us. So Father, we give ourselves to You, bringing ourselves to the point where we are willing to surrender all for Jesus because everything belongs to Him. Everything, Lord, belongs to Him. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together. Until you know the love of God. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Father, we know that at the end of this life, it's not money that is important. It's knowing God. At the end of this life, it's not fame that is important, it's knowing Jesus. At the end of this life, it's all about knowing God and knowing Jesus. For this is salvation, to know God. So we ask, Lord, that you will always establish in our lives an understanding of this truth. Only in this truth can we truly live pure holy, undefiled by the things of this life. Only when this love for Jesus burns in our heart like a fire in our bones, can we go through this life, be tempted, tested by everything in this life and remain pure and holy because we keep ourselves only for Jesus and Jesus alone. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Praise God, give you a good clap, bring God bless you.